Hello, this is Doreen from Exam Hot Lab. Today I'll be solving physics paper 2 AS level structured questions 9702 paper 2. We're into October November 2020. Starting with question number 1, part A complete table 1.1 by putting a tick in the appropriate column to indicate whether the listed quantities are scalars or vectors. Acceleration is a vector quantity. Density is a scalar quantity as well as temperature, while momentum is a vector quantity. Part B, a toy train moves along a straight section of track. Figure 1.1 shows the variation with time t of the distance d moved by the train. Part 1, describe qualitatively the motion of the train between time t is equal to 0 and time t is equal to 1 second. So from time t is equal to 0 to time t is equal to 1 second, it's a decreasing gradient. Hence, we can say that was uh, velocity of the toy car is decreasing. Part 2 to determine the speed of the train at time t is equal to 2 seconds. So from time t is equal to 1.5 seconds until time t is equal to 3 seconds, the train travels with a constant speed, which is the gradient of figure 1.1. So speed at t is equal to 2 seconds can be a gradient, gradient of the graph from t is equal to 1.5 seconds to t is equal to 3 seconds. So you can take any two values and get the gradient or the speed at time t is equal to 2 seconds. So 0.56, which is one of the speeds we are going to take, like minus 1.2 divided by 3 minus 1.5, and this is equal to 0.24 meters per second. So the speed at time t is equal to 2 seconds is 0.24 of the toy car. Part C, the straight section of track in B is part of the loop of track shown in figure 1.2. The train completes exactly one lap of the loop. State and explain the average velocity of the train over the one complete loop. So average velocity is total displacement of the car divided by time taken. Since displacement when it covers exactly one lap of the loop is zero, average velocity is also going to be zero. So we can write that displacement is zero. Therefore, average velocity is zero. Question number two, part A, a cylinder is suspended from the end of a string. The cylinder is stationary in water with the axis of the cylinder vertical as shown in figure 2.1. The cylinder has weight 0.84 newtons that acts downwards from the center. Of the mass height h n a circular cross section of diameter 0 0.031 meters the density of the water is 10 to the power 3 kilograms per meter cube the difference between the pressures on the top and the bottom faces of the cylinder is 520 pascals part one calculate the height of the cylinder h so pressure due to liquid on the cylinder is 520 is equals to density of the liquid is 10 to the power 3 into 9.81 into height h Hence, the value for h is 0 0.053 meters. Part 2 showed that the upthrust acting on the cylinder is 0.39 newtons. So, upthrust force is equal to pressure on the cylinder multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. The difference in pressure acting on the cylinder is 520 pascals while the cross-sectional area is going to be pi r square where radius is going to be 0 0.031 by half this is going to be the radius of the cylinder so change in pressure is 520 into pi r square and hence the up thrust force acting on the cylinder is 0.39 newtons part three calculate the tension t in the string Okay, the cylinder, since the cylinder is a stationary in water, so all the forces must be balanced. Uh, this means that tension and upthrust that act upwards must be equal to the cylinder's weight that acts downwards. So tension is going to be the difference between the cylinder's weight and the upthrust force that acts on it. So tension T is equal to the upthrust, the weight of the cylinder minus the upthrust, and then T is equal to 0.45 newtons. Part B, the string is now used to move the cylinder in A. 
vertically upwards through the water, the variation with time t of the velocity v of the cylinder is shown in figure 2.2. Part 1 use figure 2.2 to determine the acceleration of the cylinder at time t is equals to 2 seconds. So from time t is equals to 0 to 3 is equals to 2.5 seconds, the cylinder moves with constant positive acceleration. So at t is equals to 2 seconds, it's going to be final velocity minus initial velocity divided by the time taken for this change of velocity. And this is equals to 4 centimeters per second square. We need to convert that to meters square. So we'll divide 4 by 100. So this is going to be 0 0.04 meters per second square of acceleration at time t is equal to 2 seconds. Part 2, the top face of the cylinder is at a depth of 0.32 meters below the surface of the water at time t is equal to 0 seconds. Use figure 2.2 to determine the depth of the top face below the surface of the water at time t is equal to 4 seconds. For the interval of first 2.5 seconds, we can find the distance being covered by the cylinder, that is area under the graph, and that is... For the first 2.5 seconds, it's going to be half into 2.5 into 0.1 meters per second of speed. Plus, for the next 1.5 seconds, it covers a distance of 1 by 2 into 1.5 into 0.1, which is the speed. Again, this is the total distance it covers uh, until time is equal to t is equal to 4 seconds. From t is equal to 0 to t is equal to 4 seconds, it travels a distance of 0.2 meters vertically upwards therefore uh, 0.32 minus 0.2 which is 0.12 meters is its step at t is equal to 4 seconds part c the cylinder in b is released from the string at time t is equal to 4 seconds the cylinder falls from rest vertically downwards through the water assume that the upthrust acting on the cylinder remains constant as it falls state the name of the force that acts on the cylinder when it is moving and does not act on the cylinder when it is stationary so that's resistive force and resistive force in liquids is called viscous force Part 2 statement explained the version of any of the acceleration of the cylinder as it falls downwards through the water. So within, uh, so with time, a viscous force starts to increase, therefore acceleration decreases. So we can write that viscous force increases with time. Therefore, acceleration decreases question number three part a a spring is fixed at one end and is compressed by applying a force to the other end the variation of the force f acting on the spring with its compression x is shown in figure 3.1 the compression of 0 0.045 meters is produced when a force f1 x on the spring the spring has a spring constant of 800 newtons per meter Part 1 determine F1. So since it is obeying Hooke's law that it is a straight line through origin, so force is equals to the spring constant into extension or compression. So force is equals to the spring constant multiplied by the extension and hence at extension 0 0.045 meters. The force that is exerted is 36 newtons. Part 2 use figure 3.1 to show that for the compression of 0 0.045 meters, the elastic potential energy of the spring is 0 0.81 joules. So elastic potential energy is area under the graph of force versus compression or extension. So it's going to be half into 0 0.045 into force 36. And we must also write that elastic potential energy is equals to half into F into X. So this is equals to 0 0.81 joules. Part B, a child's toy uses the spring in part A to launch a ball of mass 0 0.02 kilograms vertically into the air. The ball is initially held against one end of the spring, which has a compression of 0 0.045 meters. The spring is then released to launch the ball. The kinetic energy of the ball as it leaves the toy is 0 0.72 joules. The toy converts the elastic potential energy of the spring into the kinetic energy of the ball. Use the information in A part 2 to calculate the percentage efficiency of this conversion. So elastic potential energy of 0.81 joules when compression is 0 0.045 meters could all convert to kinetic energy of the ball, but it only transforms 0.72 joules, so the percentage efficiency is going to be 0.72 
divided by 0.81, which is the total elastic potential energy that could convert into kinetic energy 100%. And hence, we have the percentage efficiency of this conversion as 88.9%. Part 2, determine the initial momentum of the ball as it leaves the toy. So for the momentum, momentum is equal to mass into velocity. Speed of the speed of the ball as it leaves the toy can be calculated with the help of the kinetic energy it has as it leaves the toy, which is 0 0.72. So 0 0.72 is the kinetic energy half into mass of the ball is 0 0.02 into speed squared. Hence, speed is equal to 8.485 meters per second. Now, the momentum of the ball as it leaves the toy is equal to 0 0.02 into 8.485 which is equal to 0.17 newton second part c the ball in b leaves the toy at point a and moves vertically upwards through the air point b is the position of the ball when is it at maximum height h above point a as illustrated in figure 3.2 the gravitational potential energy of the ball increases by 0.6 joules as it moves from a to b part one calculate h so increase in gravitational potential energy is equal to mass of the ball which is 0 0.02 into 9.81 into the height it covers thus h has a e value of 3.06 meters part two to determine the average force due to air resistance acting on the ball for its movement from a to b so the ball had kinetic energy of 0.72 joules at position A, but energy possessed by the ball in the form of gravitational potential energy at point B is just 0.6 joules. Therefore, difference of 0.72 and 0.6, which is 0.12 joules, is the energy that was lost due to air resistance by the ball. So 0.12 joules is equal to energy lost. Energy is equal to force into distance, hence the Resistive force is going to be equal to energy loss divided by the distance it covers from A to B, which is the height H, and that is 3.06. Hence, the average force due to air resistance is 0 0.039 newtons. Part 3, when there is air resistance, the ball takes time T to move from A to B. Statement explain whether the time taken for the ball to move from A to B to its maximum height will be more than, less than, or equal to time T if there is no air resistance. So when air resistance is significant, resultant force on the ball is its weight and air resistance, and both of them, they act downwards, hence the resultant force is a much larger force. And now when air resistance is negligible, there is only ball's weight that that uh, makes up a resultant force on the ball and the greater the resultant force the smaller the time to interval for the ball in which it travels from point a to b so when there is no air resistance resultant force in the ball is going to be less and hence time taken is going to be more for the ball to move from point a to b so we can write that when there is no air resistance Resultant force is less and hence time taken for the ball to move from A to B gets more. Since resultant force and time interval there are inversely proportional to each other according to the formula F is equal to change in momentum divided by time taken. Question number four, a rigid plank is used to make a ramp between two horizontal levels of ground as shown in figure 4.1. Point A at one end of the plank rests on the lower level of ground. A force acts on and is perpendicular to the plank at point B. The plank is held in equilibrium by a rope that connects point D of the plank uh, to the ground. The plank has a weight that may be considered to act from its center of gravity C. The rope is perpendicular to the plank and has tension T. The plank at an, is at an angle of 38 degrees to the vertical. The forces and the distances along the plank of points A, B, C, and D are shown in figure 4.1. Show that the component of the weight that is perpendicular to the plank is 59 newtons. So the vertical component of the weight is this one parallel to tension T. And this is the horizontal component. 
this is 90 degrees of angle and this angle is 38 degrees so the vertical component of the weight of the plank is going to be 96 sine 38 which is 59 units part b by taking moments about and a of the plank calculate the tension t's about point a means a is now a is the pivot the perpendicular forces that could rotate the plank from point a anti-clockwise are tension t and 96 newtons vertical component which is 59 newtons and the perpendicular forces that could rotate the plank from point a clockwise is only one force and that's 45 newtons of force at end b so now following the law of moment that total clockwise moment is equal to total anti-clockwise moment about the same points Total anti-clockwise moment is going to be made up of two forces that are tension T multiplied by the perpendicular distance between tension T and the pivot point, which is A. So 1.5 plus 0.3, which is 1.8, plus another force that leads to anti-clockwise moment of the plank, which is 96 newtons vertical component, and that is 59 newtons of force, multiplied by the perpendicular distance between that force in the pivot point a so that's 1.5 meters this is equal to sum of clockwise moment that is caused by the force 45 newtons and the perpendicular distance between 45 newtons and pivot point a is 1.5 plus 0.3 plus 1.1 which is 2.9 meters of distance so 45 into 2.9 this gives value 23.2 newtons to tension t Question number 5. Microwaves with the same wavelength and amplitude are emitted in phase from two sources X and Y. A microwave detector is moved along a path parallel to the line joining X and Y. An interference pattern is detected. A central intensity maximum is located at point A and there is an adjacent, uh, and there, and there is an adjacent intensity minimum at point B. The microwaves have a wavelength of 0.04 meters. Calculate the frequency in gigahertz of the microwaves. So frequency is equal to speed divided by the wavelength. Speed of any of the electromagnetic waves is 3 into 10 to the power of 8 divided by 0 0.04 meters of wavelength. This is equal to 7.5 into 10 to the power of 9 hertz. To convert that to gigahertz, we will divide it by 10 to the power 9 and hence the frequency of the microwaves is 7.5 gigahertz. Part B for the waves arriving at point B to determine the path difference. So the path difference between the central maximum and its adjacent minimum is going to be half of its lambda. So the value this lambda has is 0 0.04 meters. That is the wavelength. Half of 0 0.04 is 0 0.02 meters. Now the phase difference. Phase difference is going to be of 180 degrees. Again between uh, a central maximum and its adjacent minimum point phase difference is going to be of 180 degrees. Part C, the amplitudes of the waves from the sources are changed. This causes a change in the amplitude of the waves arriving at point A. At this point, the amplitude of the wave arriving from source X is doubled and the amplitude of the wave arriving from source Y is also doubled. Describe the effect, if any, on the intensity of the central maximum at point A. So when amplitude doubles, intensity of maximum points or bright fringes will increase by four times. So we can write that intensity of maximum points increases by four times. Part D describe the effect if any on the positions of the central intensity maximum and the adjacent intensity minimum due to the following separate changes. The separation of the sources X and Y is increased. So according to the formula AX by D is equals to lambda where A is the separation of the sources and X is the distance between the maximum and the minimum uh, points forming. Separation of fringes is inversely proportional to distance between the sources. So separation of maximum and minimum points will decrease when separation of the sources X and Y increase.
Now, the phase difference between the microwaves emitted by the source X and Y changes to 180 degrees. Initially, the sources were set to in phase, and now when they have been changed to 180 degrees of phase difference, maximum and minimum points will exchange their places. Now, maximum points will become minimum, and minimum will become maximum. Question number six, part A. A network of three resistors of resistances R1, R2, and R3 is shown in figure 6.1. The individual currents in the resistors are I1, I2, and I3. The total current in the combination of resistors is I, and the potential difference across the combination is V. Show that the combined resistance R of the network is given by this equation. So, first of all, combined current is equals to divided current in each of the three loops. I is equals to I1 plus I2 plus I3. And I has a formula of V by R, so combined current is combined voltage, voltage divided by combined resistance. Current across the first resistor is going to be the voltage, the main voltage divided by its resistance, plus the voltage divided by resistance 2, plus voltage divided by resistance 3. Now, when we take voltages out and we take them in common, we're going to have it cancelled and this is how we prove that the combined resistance has a formula of 1 by R is equal to 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2 plus 1 by R3. Part B, a battery of EMF 8 volt and internal resistance R is connected to three resistors X, Y and Z as shown in figure 6.2. Resistor Y has a resistance of 16 ohms. The current in resistor X is 0.49 amperes and the current in the resistor Y is 0.45 amperes. Calculate the current in the battery. So this is the main current that flows across the battery and then it gets divided in parallel connection. So 0.49 plus 0.45 is the actual current or is the sum of the current that flows across the battery. So 0.49 plus 0.45 is the total current that flows across the battery. So this is 0.94 amperes of current. Part 2, the internal resistance R of the battery. Now, for this part of the question, we will be considering the single loop and not the middle one, so we will just cancel it out. And we will follow the Kirchhoff second law, that is the total EMF of the battery is going to be equal to total PD across the loop. So 8 volts of EMF is going to be equal to PD across this resistor plus PD across the internal resistor of the battery. So P, the EMF of the battery is 8, PD across the resistor that has a resistance of 16 ohms is going to be 0.45 into 16 plus the res, PD across the internal resistance of the battery. So the current that flows across the internal resistance of the battery is the sum of 0.49 and 0.45 that was calculated in the previous part and that is 0.94 into internal resistance. And hence, internal resistance is of 0.851 ohms. Part C resistors X and Y in figure 6.2 are made from wires of the same material and cross sectional area. The average drift speed of the free electrons in X is 2.1 into 10 to the power of negative 4 meters per second. Calculate the average drift speed of the free electrons in Y. So, current is equal to NAVQ, where V is the average drift speed. First of all, for the by x we are going to have to calculate the value of n and a so the current that flows across wire x is 0.49 amperes because x and z they are in series connection means they share the same current so 0.49 is equals to n a the average speed of the electrons across x is 2.1 into 10 to the power of negative 4 into 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 hence n a for the wire x is 1.458 into 10 to the power of 22 which is going to be the same for wire y because they are made from uh, wires of the same material so average drift speed of wire y is going to be equal to the current across wire y which is 0.45 amperes divided by 
NAQ and NA has a value of 1.458 into 10 to the power of 22 multiplied by the value Q that is the charge of an electron 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 and hence the average drift speed of the free electrons in Y is 1.93 into 10 to the power of negative 4 meters per second. Part G resistor Z in figure 6.2 is replaced by a new resistor of a smaller resistance. State and explain the effect, if any, on the terminal potential difference of the battery. Resistance of resistor Z was decreased to some smaller resistance. So this will, uh, this will cause the combined resistance of the whole loop to decrease, which will also decrease the PD of this loop. So we can write that combined resistance decreases. And terminal potential difference also decreases. Question number seven, part A state a similarity and a difference between an up quark and an up anti quark. Uh, they both make up the exact same mass, so that's a similarity between them, uh, but they have the opposite charge. So that's a difference between them. Part B, figure 7.1 shows an electron in an electric field in a vacuum at an instant when the electron is stationary. On figure 7.1, draw an arrow to show the direction of the electric force acting on the stationary electron. Since the electric field lines are starting from the right, this side is going to be positively charged and therefore electron that, is, that carries a negative charge will move to this side towards the right. It will be attracted towards the right. Part 2. The electric field causes the electron to move from its initial position. Describe and explain the acceleration of the electron due to the field as the electron moves through the field. Uh, as it moves and gets more to the right, electric force will start to increase on the electron and thus the, its acceleration will also increase. So with time, electric force on the electron increases and thus its acceleration increases. Part 3 A stationary alpha particle is now placed in the same electric field at the same initial position that was occupied by the electron. Compare the initial electric force acting on the alpha particle with the initial electric force that acted on the electron. First of all, alpha particle would be attracted towards the negatively uh, charged side, which is this one. So its force is going to act in the opposite direction. And secondly, because it carries a double charge, uh, electric force that acts on the alpha particle will also be doubled. So the first point is that force acts on the opposite direction and the second point is an electric force doubles in magnitude So that was the end of the paper. Thank you for watching.